Good afternoon and welcome to our Tibbany webinar this week on Leading with Insights, Steps to a Better Leader, to be a better leader. My name is Ronan O'Farrell and I'm the CEO of the Tibbany Leadership Institute. If you're to ask me what the purpose of Tibbany Leadership Institute is, I'd summarize it by saying the line, better leaders, better organizations, better society. And our guest this week uh, is going to talk to us about better leaders. And, uh, and that's Dermot Duff, who's a man of many talents, an associate professor, uh, author of several books, an engineer. He's held senior management positions with ITT Alcatel in Holland and as European Transformation Manager for Digital Equipment Corporation before it became part of, of Hewlett Packard. As well as advising several business leaders, he lectures in Trinity College, Dublin, where he is leading the career development for MBA students. He's also held senior roles as Executive Learning Director uh, with the Irish Management Institute. And we also in Timoney have had the privilege of um, Dermot teaching on our Advanced Leadership Programme, where he featured a case study on strategy, which uh, he has authored himself. His most recent book, Managing Professionals and Other Smart People, is well worth getting your hands on. Uh, where Dermot shares uh, some of his thinking on leadership and, and motivation in, uh, as it's applied to, to real life situations in, in companies. So Dermot, you're very welcome. Uh, I know we're going to delve into some practical ideas you have compiled from your experience and from research around becoming a better leader. But uh, maybe before doing so, could, could you give us an insight into the leadership role you had at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, where you were very instrumental in, in pioneering a lean approach, maybe before it was that well known. Right, uh, Ronan, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to uh, speak to all your friends on the Intimity Institute. Uh, I greatly admire the work you're doing, better leaders, etc., leading to a better society. We can see that all around us. So I'd like to share, I suppose, some of my experiences and um, probably I uh, mightn't start with um, digital or computer companies, just to keep it a bit anonymous. I, I started uh, in the jungles of Africa as what's known as a seismologist. And I was there at the time of the rumble in the jungle, if anybody is old enough to remember that. So that was a, an interesting time. And um, somebody later said to me, I was a bit like Forrest Gump because all the major events in the world, I seemed to be on the fringes of them. Uh, largely through cluelessness rather than design, but that was the, the interesting part of it. Uh, yeah, in digital, I uh, was in charge of the European Transformation Project for Digital Equipment Services. It was one of the first, um, maybe one of the biggest, probably one of the most successful uh, change efforts in the sense that even though digital went under, and for those of you who are very young, digital was the first big computer company in Ireland. It was the Google of its day. It was a very, very attractive place uh, to work. And there was two versions. There was our version, which was kind of like a soft version of change where we encouraged people. And we got change starting at the top with the leaders. You know, the leaders had to demonstrate their authenticity, which is a complicated word, uh, for four or five months before we'd actually ask the staff to change. And that worked particularly well. Uh, on the other side of it, we had um, a much more brusque approach where you had to go around with your uh, key objectives in your pocket and recite the vision, et cetera, which seems good and practical but didn't work at all. So on our side of the house, because of the encouragement we gave um, a number of businesses, uh, at least six became multi-billion dollar businesses. So we kind of believed in the softer approach, whereas having been in the jungle and being raised on the north side, you know, I had a kind of harder approach. So for me, that was maybe my first lesson, uh, my first lesson in leadership. Go softly, maybe carry a big stick, but go softly. Go softly. Very good. Very good. And you, you, you spelled, spent some time as well with Alcatel. Um, what worked for you there? Did you apply the same go softly approach? Yeah, before I left digital, I, you know, I, we had some pretty good managers there. And one manager said to me, um, Dermot, I was just up with the executive board and um, they said you weren't fit to eat with the pigs. And I said to this boss, I said, well, what did you say back? He said, I told him you were fit to eat with the pigs. So carried some of those lessons. He also said to me one time, Dermot, you're very humble. And then he went on to say, but then again, you've a lot to be humble about. So I, I think I took that attitude when I went into Alcatel, which was a, an underperforming unit of about 40 engineers, design engineers, etc. 
And there was literally fights in the hallway. There was literally tears every day. And just by applying the same principles as the digital transformation program, managed to uh, encourage them to be a little bit more cooperative. We divided the people who couldn't stop warring, etc., and uh, eventually came up with patents, 39 patents that led to Alcatel ITT having a, a separate uh, division completely. I, I knew they're very smart people there because like in good Dutch style, you know, I started at half seven, found the engineers were there at half six. I said, oh, that's pretty good. So I started coming in a half hour earlier, but they came in a half hour earlier again. Then I came in a half hour. So <clears throat> I continued like this until I discovered that what they were doing is they were using our machines and our equipment and our materials to actually produce the first illegal sky decoder back then. So I could have fired them, but I knew I had them over a barrel. So I got them to apply their, uh, their ingenuity to other things. And that led to the 39 patents, which led to um, a fair degree of success for the company. Yeah. So Fantastic. So yeah. turning, turning a, uh, what could have been a disaster and a big weakness there to, to a real strength in, uh, for, the, yeah, for so the company and for them, I suppose, as well. Yeah, so we often talk about, you know, cognitive ability and so on, intellectual capacity in engineers and in leaders, but there's a little bit of shrewdness needed as well, you know, so you might argue that maybe it was a little bit immoral to, you know, have them over a barrel like that, but I, I thought it was fair justice and I think the results proved it. But we'll see later on, it's not all about results, it's not what you do, we'll see that with Steve Jobs, you know, what he did was fantastic, but nobody seems to be want to like him, he's not appreciated by society, so it's uh, not just what, it's how as well. So that's the two dimensions. Pretty I would good. Have said it was pretty good on the what originally, very poor on the how. But I went to programs like your own and you know saw my own character reflected back to me. And a bit like what I see in the screen here, I didn't like what I saw. <laughs> so that, that was really enlightening. So education, you know, particularly um, education into your own psychology, your own disposition can be very enlightening. I think Timmy brings a lot to that as well. Very good, very good. Well, I, I know you're, you're more than happy to answer questions uh, later on as we go through the, the webinar. So there are the opportunity there at the bottom of the screen to put in questions uh, in the Q&A box and we'll, uh, we'll come to those uh, later on. But maybe Dermot, if just drawing on all, all of that of what you said and thank you for, for sharing it. What, um, if I suppose the, pose the question, what is leadership? How do you see it? Yeah, I'll answer that by you know, talking about the kind of stuff I do mainly at the moment, which is uh, the school around the corner from you, Ronan, called Trinity. It's there a little while, 427 years. Hopefully it's still there after um, COVID with the huge losses that uh, the college is about to incur. But uh, I work at two levels. I, I choose her, which is basically coach, I suppose, um, MBA projects and also a master's ones. And they're both masters, so you think they're both the same. But with the master's one, you teach them something functional like marketing or finance or whatever, and hopefully they know a little bit more at the end of the year. But with the MBA, you teach them the same things, but you're also trying to get them to be a leader. So it brings us into, you know, what do leaders actually do? Uh, well, they get something done is what they do. But we find that it's almost an unteachable thing. So the purpose of the projects is to steep them in a situation where they teach themselves about themselves, the way I learned, etc. And we put them in very difficult situations, um, not cruelly difficult, um, it's not intended to be a boot camp, but sufficient challenge in the projects, um, which will be things like coming up with a strategic plan for a company, steep them in those projects, and then they have to be good at uh, an industry analysis, which is the critical thinking bit. They have to be very good at appraising a company, which sounds easy, everybody thinks we know how to do it, but in some kind of defensible way based on evidence, then you have to be very good at innovation, coming up with solutions, and then very good at giving the practical implementation plan behind it. All these things are simple to say, but very hard to do. So the role of a tutor such as myself is, is to guide them through that. And you wouldn't know at a first meeting with these students, usually in teams of six, um, you know, how they're going to get on, but you would know after, let's say, a month of working with them, etc. And the distinguishing factor seems to be, um, one would be intelligence, yeah, but they're all intelligent if they're on the MBA. I mean, their GPAs and their underscores are just beyond mine. They're, they're massive scores. Um, but it seems to be the ability to hold, you know, more than five or six concepts in their head at the one time and not get confused by it. So it's the ability to synthesize, to condense, to simplify, so they kind of get what it's all about. Similarly, on the emotional level, they seem to be able to get the different types and how to respond to them. And with that, they seem to have a range of styles rather than one style applied over and over again. 
but uh, maybe beyond that, they even have a, an openness to learning, which we might call humility. And you'll see with uh, humility, it seems to be the supreme virtue. That's what Socrates said anyway. And you'll see it in, in Irish uh, leaders as well. Dr. Jimmy Sheen will be a big hero of mine. And, you know, he would be the essence of humility. So what I'm saying, it's a, it seems to be ability to encompass a range of things, uh, both cognitively and, and emotionally, and have a range of styles rather than a single style to deploy. And is this a something that we're born with or we're creating it over the course of our lifetime? That famous uh, and well-versed debate. Uh, well, to be semantic about it, leaders are always born. It's the only way you come into life. Um, but they're always made as well. Um, definitely some people come in with more advantages than others. They might have more energy, more drive. They might have more original cognitive ability, though I'll see later that can even be uh, improved, etc. cetera. Um, but it seems to depend an awful lot um, on their early experience. By early experience, I mean something that might happen to them around, you know, the 13, 11, 14 years of age kind of thing, etc. And that seems to shape them for, for, for good or for evil. Um, Evil when they want to control the world for their own purposes, and you'll see that in guys like Stalin and Lenin. I mean, these guys had horrendous kind of uh, backgrounds. You'll see it in guys like Idi Amin, you know, losing their father, watching them be shot, and then, of course, they go on to shoot anyone who disagrees with them and so on. But you'll also see it in the positive side, like Abraham Lincoln, you know, he happened to be in New Orleans, you know, not quite at that age, a little bit older, but he saw what was happening with slavery and, you know, he just couldn't stand it. So one of the things he wanted to do was change the world for good. So you can be a leader for good or you can be a little bit more Hitler-esque. You know, you can get attached to a dysfunctional view of the world, maybe a dysfunctional view of yourself, and that seems to create it. And, and to in, just on that, in, to what extent is, you know, limiting beliefs that maybe are acquired young at, uh, in, in, in person's youth, how, how that might hold them back from uh, becoming a leader. They might have what you talked about earlier there, the, the, the capability and the, the ability to flex in different leadership styles, but, but maybe don't see it in themselves and it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think we're all in a bit of a psychic prison, aren't we? You know, with things you believe we can do and can't do, etc. Um, so, yeah, often if you find the right mentor, like the guy I mentioned, who, you know, humorously told me, I don't have to be humble about it. He, he, I presume he didn't mean it, maybe he did, etc. So if you find the right kind of mentor, if you find the right kind of educational opportunities, then, then you can turn around. Um, so the things seem to be what Socrates always said, you know, it's your ethos, it's your ethics, you know, do you believe in good or do you believe in not so good, etc. And then pathos, which is the ability to deal with people at the emotional level. And then ultimately logos, which we'll call um, competence or intelligence or something like that. So, so there are the three parts of the triangle. Wait. So uh, maybe we should put it to the group, have a quick poll, shall we, about, you know, how they see leadership. You know, Very is good. It or is it... Um, is it, um, what the expression did we use? Cognitive ability or character? Ability, yes. Okay. Here it is. Character, you know, um, the people kind of aspect, etc. Uh, the emotional kind of aspect. Cognitive ability, which we call brain power. And we could debate these definitions um, endlessly and forever, but I think people uh, more or less know what we mean. You know, is it your people skills, your charm, etc., Or is it your ability to get things done? And I suppose people will say it's both, isn't it? And that's what I've just said. But uh, it'd be good to get people's opinion. And we could call that research if we have more than three or four people on the webinar. Yeah, well, we, we, we've, uh, we've already had about 70% have voted. So uh, they're, they're, they're certainly giving their view here. I didn't vote myself. How did it turn out? Oh, <laughs> very good. So it's all about character. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because if you don't gain people's trust, you're not going to go anywhere. So yeah, character is fundamental. Yeah. So if you don't have that, it's a it's a necessary condition. And then I suppose the distinguishing condition is to be able to do something on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Very bright group on here. Hmm. Thank you very much for the poll. That was quick. Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Obviously, you know, some of the leaders you, you, you gave examples of there, you know, they were in different times, different, different eras. It's, uh, it's hard to judge sometimes when you're 100 years away or even 30 years away from what the situation people found themselves in then. But um, right now, 
with the kind of leadership that people need, the skills they need now for the next year, next six months. Um, what, um, how can people really cope with this very changed world and that's going to continue changing quite a bit uh, and be prepared really for changes that are coming? Uh, what, would you, uh, what would you be recommending? Well, these days we always say that the rate of change is increasing. And if you look at it historically around 1900 and something, you know, with all the Einstein stuff and all the introduction of flight and the heavy industrialization of the area, you know, there's probably more um, change in that scope. And we were always what we did to a certain extent. If you're a cobbler, you're a cobbler, a tailor, you're a tailor. But I think these days it's um, increasingly about, you know, who you are, what you stand for. And of course, we work in a more networked, more societal kind of way. So it's your ability to get on with people like if you're a cobbler and you're a grumpy sort of cobbler. That was grand. But now it is definitely about innovation. You don't have a job or, you know, career um, for, for that long. Uh, as you probably know, I decided myself to have a different career every seven years, which is kind of interesting. Thing. Uh, I skipped skipped the last seven, but before that, I, I managed to, to do it. It just gave me more life, etc. So now it's more about right. your, your personal values, your ability to innovate, your ability to cooperate. And we've moved from that kind of um, agrarian society to this industrial society. Um, people would have said we're in the industrial age until maybe last year. Now it's the smart interconnected age where everything's based on um, digitalization. Everybody now, you know, uh, glibly talks about AI and uh, VR and AR and all the rest of it. And um, these things would have been evident about four or five years ago. We're involved in some of the projects our, ourselves. So you can have a little preview of what's changing, but therefore the skills need to change the technical ones. But the complexity of, of uh, people who are working in the area, the professionals, you have to understand them at a deeper level. And I think anecdotally, people would say, well, it's very hard to understand some types of people like computer science, etc. But ultimately, everybody is a person and everybody has to be understood and everybody has to be approached in a way that's going to work for them rather than just your own native style. And that's what I mean by having a, a range of style that seems to work. And also, despite all the pandemics, etc., we are actually in a golden era and have been in all the recessions. I mean, people talk about, you know, self-actualization now. You know, your father or your mother struggled to survive and put food on the table. Now it's about the higher order, worrying about uh, global values and the future of the globe, etc. And that's all commendable. I'm not knocking it in any way, but I'm just saying that things have actually changed. We've moved up the Maslow hierarchy. So for that reason, you know, good books to be involved in will be the one by Simon Sinek, you know, first start with why, which mm -hmm. to go back to the Apple reference, you know, they had a reason for why they didn't just make things. They deliberately tried to set out to change the world. So you do need this kind of vision, but the vision can't be just a, an idle dream. It has to be based on a, a kind of current reality and an informed view of the future. So in other words, I'm saying, if you look back, we could have forecasted what's happening with AI and digitalization five, six years ago, etc. It's now possible to look at the next five or six years, etc. But people basically are so tied up in what they have to do today that they haven't a chance to look at tomorrow. But that would be a distinguishing factor of a leader to be that page ahead. A page. Yeah, we had last week we had a webinar with uh, Carlos Ray, and we we talked quite a bit about the whole area of of purpose you know, your own personal purpose and the purpose of the organization and, yeah. and trying to get that shared purpose of combining, combining the two. Yes. And, uh, and that, as you say, the, the importance of knowing your why mm. in, uh, in, in these times. You, yeah, you mentioned um, there a couple of times, there. sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's why I admire so much what Timothy do, et cetera. But I, I, I think, you know, with self-limiting beliefs, uh, one of the surprising things discovered by um, um, a researcher, Carl Dweck in uh, Harvard, was that even smart people, or particularly the smartest people, because they'd invested so much in their own education and they tied up their, their whole self-esteem with their intelligence rather than any other things, et cetera, that after a while they became reluctant to change. You'll, you'll see it particularly in some of the professions, et cetera. So she called it a, a limiting mindset. And uh, I've talked about people who are maybe experienced in the profession, but it seems to start in the early teenage years. You know, if you admire a kid, you know, oh, you're very bright, you're very bright, etc. They cling on to the brightness. So they have a fixed mindset. So when it comes to something like challenge, they want to avoid the challenge because they, they could actually fail. Whereas somebody with a more agile, open growth mindset, as Carol Dweck calls it, you know, will embrace the change. Um, when you come to an obstacle, some kids will just kind of, you know, give up at it. Others will persist. Others will see it as, um, you know, the next level, then people will see it as 
the price you have to pay for, for mastery, you know, and they're willing to pay that price. And, you know, the journey is the thing as much as the destination is what they would look at it with a growth mindset. I'm a criticism. They would seek it. And to go back to my MSc and MBA students, the ones that would come to say, well, you know, how could I do better? I mean, they're the ones that ultimately get there. Like if you make a small change each and every day for a year, that's 365, you know, that's kind of an unbeatable rate, etc. And I suppose in combination with that, it's, you know, we're all going to make mistakes. Um, certainly I am anyway. <laughs> um, but it's the ability to bounce back. So you have the rocky stuff, you know, getting up one more time. And that's, that's valid. We want that. I mean, we want effort. But there's also the thing about building in your kind of pre-recovery, a bit like athletes do. You know, they don't run 100 miles an hour, 24 hours a day. They, you know, get into the ice bath or whatever. They do the psychological thing. And they build in the recovery. It's kind of like a buffer built in. Yeah, you, you're, you're reminding me there of the the uh, that whole thing of, of failure as well. You know, the comment that uh, Michael Jordan, basketball player, made about I failed over and over and over again in my life, but that is why I succeed. You know, that having that that uh, growth mindset of of uh, of wanting to uh, to keep improving. So, how do we overcome this this uh, this kind of fear of failure and uh, that's there. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I did mention the bounce back ability kind of stuff, etc. cetera. Um, but I was fascinated by the lack of real help and self-confidence. Now you've seen in the last six, seven years, maybe for the reasons we mentioned about the digital age, that there's a, a whole bunch of books um, on self-confidence, but they seem to have the same mantra of just, you know, try again and you'll get better with repetition. They're, they're correct, you'll get better at repetition, but in my experience, uh, people don't actually increase their self-esteem, their self-confidence, uh, unless they change fundamentally and they stop valuing themselves for their level of achievement. You know, even the high achievers, you know, will have difficulty in this area for kind of the reasons that I mentioned. So you can urge them to sort of believe in a different value set, you know, that, you know, you're, you're loved for who you are, not so much for what you do, you know, you have a value in other ways, etc. It's, it's not all about, you know, uh, climbing the greasy pole, etc, etc. But there's no urgency in that. So what I try to do to put some urgency in is say, okay, we're going to pick a time where you're going to flip the switch now, where you're actually going to believe in yourself and you're going to say you believe in yourself and you're going to be positive and you're going to be optimistic. We know you're faking it. We know you're faking it. And it takes a bit of courage to actually fake it in the first place. I realize that. But ultimately, that's it. You know, you have to fake it till you make it. And you'll never completely overcome it, but you'll get uh, better at it uh, anyway. So, yeah, that would be my fundamental point. You know, you have to fake it till you make it, which seems like an illusory kind of concept, but it's one of the few that actually, um, in my experience, seems to work. work. Uh, with okay. that, I'd put in a, a little bit of, um, you know, loving yourself. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of self-compassion. If you don't have compassion for yourself, you won't have compassion for others. For others. Therefore, you won't have the empathy. Therefore, you won't be able to relate to all the different types that are that are all around us. Very good. Yeah, very. It's 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 very profound, and I, I think even from what you were saying there earlier about the likes of Socrates and so forth, some of these principles are are ones that are thousands of years old that we 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 kind of need to rediscover uh, on on a regular basis rather than than chasing some uh, some new fad. But had you another poll you wanted to uh, to put to the audience on on this topic? Yeah, and, you know, I put something there that is a personal belief. I think it's backed up a little bit of research, etc. Another chapter in my book, which, by the way, I, I can't show you. It's, it's sold out. But um, <laughs> great complaint. I didn't go on myself. <laughs> um, so, um, so the question is, you know, uh, fake it till you make it. A uh, little bit based on um, Catch Me If You Can. If you remember that kind of movie with Frank Abernale, I think that's how you pronounce his name, where he even pretended to be a surgeon. And he certainly had a fantastic time where he pretended to be a pilot. So he went into high school and he actually pretended to be the teacher and got away with it, etc. So, you know, um, you know, the question is, Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you'll be right. Was he correct or not? It's a tribute to Henry Ford, but I believe Evelyn Roosevelt also said it. So it'll be interesting to see what um, the people on the webinar think of that. Okay. Okay. Well, they're they're voting away as 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 we as we speak, and uh, that um, I mean that that self confidence piece as well. It does relate in some way to humility as well, doesn't 
Oh, it is. Yeah, humility. It's uh, uh, yeah, the supreme virtue. Once again, that's the, the Socrates thing. But without humility, you're not open to change. You're not opening to learning, and you caught in the smart people trap uh, again and again, over and over. And you know, once you're caught in it, it's a downward spiral rather than an upward spiral. Having done it once, you're trying to do it again, and a couple of years later, you you really are trapped. Excellent. Well, I think the the, the poll has uh, concluded there. So, oh, great. So you've got a little bit more diversity here. Oh, that's great. So eighty-two uh, percent believe it in the Henry Ford method. Yeah, okay. I was wasn't expecting such agreement. Yeah, but as I said. What a great group you have on here. Must be all that ALP training that you've given them. Very good. Well, just to remind people again, if you want to ask a question to, to Dermot, uh, just put it in in, uh, in the Q&A box and we'll be coming to that uh, shortly. And uh, we'll um, continue on in the meantime, if I can get rid of this poll now. <laughs> so, Ronan, it's, um, it's kind of the dual thing. You'll see it in those Chinese kind of symbols, opportunity and crisis in the same kind of thing. So it's always a dichotomy. You have to be humble, you know, enough, um, but yet confident. Um, they're not contradictory. They seem contradictory. You have to be driven, you know, have the energy, uh, but you also have to be caring. Seems like a contradiction, but it's not. And then, as I was saying earlier, treat everybody equally. Mm -hmm. But don't treat everybody the same. You have to talk to different people in a, in a slightly different way, as much out of courtesy, but certainly out of effectiveness. So it's overcoming those dichotomies or those dilemmas that seems to be the things that have to be uh, cracked if you're to be a good leader, which is why we're talking about things like empathy and, and trust and all the rest of it, because there's a lot in the management books about visioning and so on and so forth, but there's uh, not so much about this. So that's why we have a discussion here rather than some kind of pronouncement on things. And sure. that's why we're having the polls rather than uh, making declarations. Very good. Yeah. And, and that um, without that self-confidence, that healthy self-confidence, let's say you, you can't really make others confident, can you? No, you can't. And it goes back to the uh, first bit, um, uh, trust which the respondents sort of said, yeah, you definitely need that. And then the next thing then is, um, you know, effectiveness. So um, when you look into trust, a bit like self-confidence, a lot recently, um, maybe not that much that's kind of um, useful in it, but it seems to me that it's the same story. It's the good news wrapped up with the bad stories. Um, you definitely need the affection thing. You know, uh, salespeople often use this expression, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So that's definitely the first thing, etc. But then there's the simple effectiveness, you know, actually respond quickly, keep your commitment, break your promises, don't go around uh, behind people's pack, uh, back and, you know, gossiping, etc., etc. So yeah, so it's affection and it's affection. If I can, if I can mutilate the two words there and affection <laughs> goes back to the love kind of thing, I suppose, but then, uh, that's what I say, affect versus effect. Effect, okay, okay. And um, are you saying we need to kind of get to a certain stage of perfection here before we can, uh, we can lead? Or is this, this is a journey really, isn't it? It's definitely a journey. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I wrote this book, Managing Professionals and Other Smart People, because I want to write one about managing uh, clever people like yourself, Roland, etc. But um, a guy called Gareth Jones uh, beat me to it. He wrote a book called Clevers, which is all about managing them, the real diva-esque kind of clever people. When, when I spoke to people in the field, like managers and business owners, they really want people who are as clever as possible, but didn't want the, the divas. So uh, Gareth Jones came up with a book uh, called, um, um, it's a bit similar to this one. Why should anyone want to work? What's not coming across, is it? No, it's kind of, you just read it out, yeah, because the background. Yeah. Why should anyone, <laughs> what, what, you know, why should anyone be led by you was his basic point, etc. And he's saying, well, you know, you become a manager, you know, that's just the authority bit, but, you know, you have to do the influence bit as well, and you have to do the caring piece and, and all the rest of it. So his message was, you, you, you know, you, you, you have to be yourself. Uh, as a kind of waggish remark, you say everyone else is taken. So you have to be yourself. In fact, you have to be more of yourself. You have to reveal more of yourself, but in a kind of skillful way. So he says, be, be yourself. You can only be yourself, but be more of yourself, but not in a clumsy way. By a clumsy way, as I said, you know, when I first got this kind of psychological report, it was actually a bell in one of my team role, etc. I suddenly realized it was a little bit too dominant and so on. So if you can, you know, 
see yourself in the mirror for what you are, if you can see other people and assess them the right way, then you have the right kind of skills. And the right kind of skills seems to revolve uh, about what I said, but also about your conversational ability, the ability to say something in a way that uh, can be accepted by the other person. And strangely enough, if to bring an Irish dimension to this, and um, the McKinsey surveys over the years have always, and this is going to go down tremendously badly with <laughs> the people on the uh, webinar, but they've always concluded that Irish management, whether in multinationals or small businesses, were very, very poor at uh, giving feedback. They're very, very poor at confronting an issue. They would go around the uh, people's back and hope that the message would through some kind of circuitous route actually get there, but they wouldn't confront it in some kind of sensitive uh, uh, way. So I would say conversational ability, the ability to give a message in the right kind of way that it can be absorbed, that it doesn't completely undermine people, etc. And it has a teaching, a coaching kind of element to it. Here, let me show you how this might be done differently. It might be done better, yeah. And, and, and I suppose recognizing that most people want to be the best leader they can. So you're, you're only helping them by giving them that feedback rather than yeah. in any way trying to humiliate or, or undermine them. Yeah. All right. Are we are we okay in polls? Will we go on? Good. Yeah. Um. What's the? There's, you have another poll lined up now. Is it for that? No, well, it was coming later. Versus effect one. Oh yes. Yeah. Let's go with that. Yeah. Very good. So, what's which would you rate as more significant element in building trust? Effectiveness, doing what you said you'd do, or affection, being empathetic, friendly, respectful. I think based on the previous results, I think we can predict what this one's going to be. But let's see how the voting comes in. Let's see how Norway votes. Nul point. <laughs> Very good. I, uh, it's, it's interesting on the, what you're saying there as well about, about knowing yourself and, and some of the insights that you got. It, uh, they do say that a lack of self-awareness is, is one of the predominant leadership flaws. And uh, it's one of the reasons on the leadership program we've, we've now introduced to a, uh, an assessment to help leaders really get to know themselves better uh, on, you know, to be able to exploit that, to really be able to use it for, for their own benefit and, uh, and recognize who they're not as well, which is, uh, is probably equally important. There's the results, Ronan. Any surprise there? Very good. Okay. So 64% saying effectiveness and 36% saying affection. So, I, okay, it would be different interpretations there, but I suppose people are saying, um, because they said earlier charm was really the uh, fundamental, I think they might be saying here, you can quickly lose that if you, you, know, if you don't reply, you don't respond, et cetera, the whole thing just, uh, you, you lose the credibility, really. Yes, yeah. no, that's, very, that's very interesting, very interesting. Very good. So, so what they say is, you know, trust is very slow to get built uh, and easy to lose. And it, it seems to arise um, through um, re repeated meeting of commitments, which is what the um, webinar respondents have said, but it also seems to come from similarity. So if you have a Northsider like me, who's also an engineer originally, whatever, and um, you know, we would you know, see each other as being you know, the right kind of people and so on. So uh, one of the ways that you have to improve is to, to recognize the different types of people um, and uh, respond accordingly. So if people have different cultures, who doesn't? You know, it takes a while to understand what the different cultures are and, and how to actually go there. One of the projects we had last year was a fantastic project in China for a new technology, um, new solar technology that was going to, that has been introduced. It's very expensive and, and um, very efficient, driven by the Chinese government and all the rest. So after four days of really intensive work there and a very long presentation, we concluded it with um, a, a little China symbol um, in red, etc., with the flag and all, everything was going to be good. And we put in a, some Chinese expressions. We had some there to speak Chinese, etc. But we put it, um, a little piggyback beside it to show success and the whole crowd gasped. Oh, how could you be so insulting to us? That is, you know, you're calling us all pigs, etc., etc., etc. So cultural awareness, you can read it in the Hofstede books and Aaron Meyer and all the rest. But ultimately, mm, uh, a, it's a minefield out there. I'm so if you can navigate those waters, you can build the similarity. I would say. Well, can we go jump back a little bit to to the the whole area of limiting beliefs and you know this idea sometimes that I'm not good at that or uh, that's just not me or. Um, and maybe a, not, not seeing that we can learn new things or new skills 
continuing to learn throughout our, our life. I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Can we take up new things, new skills, improve our capacity for in the leadership space? Uh, we, we certainly can. I mean, we, we did say, you know, intelligence kind of helps a little bit in the leadership game, but actually what the, the research says is you just have to be a little bit more intelligent than average, uh, which means, yeah, that if you can improve it a little bit, and IQ these days uh, for the last hundred and something years has been regarded as largely immutable, it's fixed and cannot be changed. But the original IQ test was invented by um, a French guy in, in Paris and he devised it for exactly the other reasons. But uh, something got lost in translation and it became, you know, one of these things that you can't really improve. It. Now, it, it won't improve on its own. Uh, well, actually, it will improve slightly on its own with age and experience. But it can be made to improve and it can really only be made to improve by doing different things. So uh, my son who plays the guitar tells me playing the guitar will improve it by points, which is enough to bring you over maybe the average, etc. But then it's, um, you know, the seeking of novelty and uh, the maintenance of curiosity, the extension of your network of friends, you know, so you have different kinds of perspectives, etc. And um, doing tough tasks, you know, things that really stretch, etc. Having some kind of goal, having some kind of reason to get up in the morning, having some kind of people you relate to. All these things give you a better life, mm -hmm. uh, but they also make you a better leader. So I often say, you know, a, a better person will automatically be a better, uh, better leader. So yeah, you have to get outside your comfort zone a little bit and, and try new things. Otherwise, you, you rust out where it's much better to actually burn out. Burn out. Very good. Yeah. And what, what about teaching, investing time and in teaching others, mentoring others to be leaders? Well, they, they say you don't know anything until you actually teach it. They also say, you know, uh, <laughs> some people do and those who can't teach. And uh, yeah, we'd be open to a little bit of criticism there ourselves. But yeah, that's, that would seem to be the way, the educational kind of piece to it. I mean, you can, you know, learn from your own experience, but it takes a long time. If you take the right, undertake the right kind of program, which I presume Timothy would actually do, you can learn from other people's experience, particularly with your um, love of the case method, which creates a kind of reality and then the nuance of a situation can, can emerge. So yeah, that would be the thing. I mean, you can see it with things like, you know, you can find your way around the city great and then, you know, you get the help of GPS from Google or Apple or something. And then after a while, you know, you're relying on the damn thing. You don't know where to turn left or where to turn right. So constant challenge, unfortunately, seems to be the way. So it's the yin and the yang again. So maybe before we go on to some of the questions, uh, you, you have another poll there to uh, on, on, on that particular topic, I think, to uh, see what the audience think. All right, so I've offered the opinion that uh, brain power can be increased and we're looking for a respondent's opinion whether that's true or not. So it's another uh, yes or, or no poll that uh, Alison, and by the way, thank you for your support, Alison, that Alison's going to put up. Very good. Okay. And while, while we're doing that, it, it wasn't Alison's idea to have the space age uh, background, it was mine. <laughs> Very good. Okay, that's uh, some reason not, not showing there. Let's, let's see. So I, what I'd add to the previous mix then is optimism. You know, if you, you know, um, if you speak to the psychologists or other the psychiatrists, you know, if you actually see the world as it is, it's a very depressing thing and we all end up in the same kind of place, don't we, etc. cetera. Um, but even optimism, like false optimism can kind of help because it gives you the energy to go on. Otherwise you just get into a slump of depression, etc. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the, uh, the poll is up there now? Let me just... Yeah. By the way, I'm not voting myself. I'm not okay. part of a well-known political party. Okay, we're back. Uh, we're back up there now. So, can brain power, intellectual capacity, be increased? In your opinion, yes or no? So, I, okay, very good. I think the last vote come in now. One more. Right, we'll take it there. So that's fairly resounding. Um, agreement with you there on that one, Dermot. That it can be increased. So 70, 87 percent uh, think yes, brain power, power can be increased. And uh, oh, okay, that's actually brilliant. Yeah, that's actually brilliant because the, the prevailing uh, opinion is that no, it can't. You just look at it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that our capacity is fixed. So very interesting. Okay, well, we have to get a PhD to uh, put their name to it and put this out as research then. <laughs> Very good. Well, just uh, we, we sort of touched on it earlier, but Anne Morgan uh, has put in a question. In a crisis situation such as we're navigating our way through at present, 
what would be your top one or two practical tips for leaders? Um, yeah, I think this is my fourth crisis, maybe my fifth, depending on how, many, how you count recessions and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, in crisis, there's always a little bit of challenge, a little bit of hope for someone somewhere. So I was on a call with Enterprise Ireland this morning and uh, I, it was the construction industry sector. I was expecting to say it's all over. It's all like it was in the last recession, etc. But they were able to say, uh, actually, no, it's, it's quite the opposite. The contracts we have now are with global corporations like the famous rapacious KKK, who are signing billion dollar contracts for things like new data centers. Now, I know data centers can't go on forever, but this seems to be a play to, uh, you know, go beyond what Amazon Web Services are, are, are doing. Happened to be in a family that, um, you know, been dealing with bikes since 1912. Um, they're all run off their feet, <laughs> selling bicycles and doing repairs, etc. But right. even if you're not in a sector that looks uh, optimistic, you, you have to sell some kind of hope. Um, you might have to do some things you prefer not to do because they're just necessary. But then it's uh, about the plan to, 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 to go on. So, you know, if you want to know why I, I left digital in the first place, we were doing fantastically well. But then ultimately, um, there was a lack of strategy about how to actually go forward. And, um, you know, so there was wave after wave of cut, 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 but there wasn't a plan to get, really get out of it other than cut. So you, you might and probably will have to downsize if it's that bad. But, you know, how is your strategizing? Uh, can you look back four or five years ahead, recognize the uh, opportunities that you can avail of, that you have the skills for, and then put a credible plan in place? So to go back to maybe my, my, my experience in Germany um, with, with digital time, um, they had planned to fire 1,000 people out of 2,000. And I said to the guy running in Germany, I said, well, you know, you know, what's the plan? He said, what do you mean the plan? The plan is to fire people. I said, yeah, but you have to give some kind of hope with it. You have to give some kind of way out of it, et cetera. And then people will probably accept the plan at least a lot more easily. So it's a combination of hope and, and strategizing, I would say to Anne. Wouldn't mind hearing back her comment if she has a different or better view. Very good, very good. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see if, uh, if, if Anne comes back on that. She can pop it in the Q&A or if she'd like to go come live, we can, we can do that as well. Now, James Geraghty has, uh, has a question for her. He's going to come in, uh, in live uh, here as well to ask his question. Hi, James. Let's see, is he, uh... okay, no, he seems to, uh, seems to have uh, not be available there. So I'll go to, uh, to the next one, which is um, from Louis Davis in Galway. So Louis Davis. Hello. Oh, I I know that name, don't I? Yes, and... Dermot. Hello, can you hear me? I can, Louis. You, you sound the same, which is encouraging. <laughs> well, it, it, thanks for a, a great webinar, guys. It's fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask Dermot a personal question, actually. Um, Dermot, think of, of you thought of, if you think of a leader, uh, who uh, is the leader that you were most inspired by or you, see, you would put up there as an example uh, to point to in, in your life? Maybe even influence you to go into this uh, field. Just, just curious. Um, What's, what's, your, what's your bar? What's your standard? And uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Louis. Uh, good question. Tough question. Because there's quite a few. A few I've already mentioned. Jimmy Sheen would be my big hero. Uh, and uh, I, I think he knows that. Maybe you might know that yourself. Mike Moon, who was my very first manager. He was really brilliant. He was Irish, but had a lot of American experience. And he brought in some of the thinking that would be... Uh, uh, contemporary today. But I, I suppose after a while, what I came to believe is that um, it's as much the process uh, as anything else. And the reason I'm saying that is um, we had, uh, as part of the digital experience, we had a program that was based on Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I think I might have mentioned it earlier that we got the leaders at the top to show their authenticity first before asking the others to get involved. It's, that's not usually the way. But it was like uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program was actually based on that. It was heavily disguised, but that's what it was actually based on. And it involved things like, you know, facing up to reality, taking one step at a time, having good habits, and so on and so forth. So, um, the, you know, all the personalities are good. I mean, we mentioned that um, 
you know, that Steve Jobs was good, but, you know, and you could look at um, uh, Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, what a fabulous job he's done to create Ryanair, and yet he get criticised for, for making air travel. So the what and the who, so I kind of moved away from um, a big admiration of people and more an admiration for, for the process by which uh, the leadership um, challenge can actually be accomplished. So sorry if I haven't put someone on, on a pedestal there, Louis, but um, that, that would be my answer. I wouldn't mind if you care to respond or add to it. Well, um, no, thanks very much. Um, I, I was, um, I was just very curious. I, I, I was thinking myself um, from uh, from a book point of view. Um, I think Jim Collins' work around uh, leadership on good to great has been so influential and widespread. And if I may, just I'd love your uh, opinion on that as well. He defines the five levels of leadership. Blah blah. blah. So. I don't know if I'm going to sneak another question in, Ronan, or not. But uh, uh, we're we're we no, we'll we'll hold on that because there's a series of yeah. other ones coming coming here. Go so I'll, I'll let Dermot respond to that, and then we'll we'll uh, briefly we'll we'll move on because I know there's two others uh, lining up here. Uh, yeah. Okay, Louis. Thanks for the question. And thanks for for the prompt there. I, I I think you know that Jim Collins and I have a bit of a shared history. Um, uh, going back to when I was um, involved in fairly senior programs in the Irish Management Institute, which were always uh, connected with Trinity, now connected with, with UCC. And um, a guy called Jerry Creener came to me um, and he had a small business along with four other guys, etc. And um, he wanted to do the masters. And I said, well, yeah, Jerry, it's all very well doing the masters, but there's an awful lot of reading. And he said to me, um, why, why would he read all the books if I'm the professor, so-called, and I've read all the books? <laughs> so we came to a conclusion. Um, um, there was a book just emerged at the time. It was called Good to Great um, by Jim Collins. <laughs> so I said, will you read one book, Jerry? He said, yeah, I'll read one book. Good to Great. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll do that, etc." And then he came up with this great notion that, uh, you know, maybe we should call Jim. So to make a long story short, uh, I researched Jim, found a Collins name, and, you know, made a connection with Michael Collins, found out he was from Boulder, Colorado, where I met my own good wife, etc. cetera, uh, taught in the university uh, uh, in Boulder, etc. cetera, and, and did all the right things to get him. I like, man, I really love the idea of coming over to Ireland and really greatly called the secretary, said, Nancy, Nancy, finally when we can get over to Ireland, and she flicked through the pages, can't go this year, Jim can't go next year. Man, oh man, Jim was so disappointed. He said, I'll tell you what, if we'll find a date, we'll find a date and I'll give you the academic grade, he said. And I said, oh, that's great, Jim. How much is that? $70,000 plus expenses. <laughs> so across the line, across the Atlantic, um, you know, Jim could hear the pause and knew this wasn't going to be a runner. He said, oh, well, I'll tell you what then. Uh, what we can do instead is, um, I'm teaching in the, y, the YMCA in New York uh, next Thursday week or something. You get yourself a fly for 200 bucks or something like that. $15 admission, you get the exact same thing if you want to come on over. So uh, that became the plan. So um, so Jerry, yeah, didn't read a book, <laughs> but uh, went to that kind of seminar, etc. And uh, grew his business based on the principles there, which is why I'm talking about process. And eventually grew it to 800 people, I think, from the 20 he had at the beginning. So he moved himself from good to great by doing what it says in the book. Uh, he since sold out and started another business uh, originally in Singapore and uh, has since moved to Boston where he started yet another business. So yeah, a fantastic story and a potential hero as well. So thanks for the prompt, Louis. Great, thank you for that. Well, uh, James Garrity uh, has, uh, hopefully is live now. If not, I, I have his question here so I can read it out. <laughs> you may, um, James, great. Um, hi guys, uh, thank you for a, a really interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, is where should one's moral compass stand when you are trying to improve as a, le a leader? The reason I asked that as over the last 10 weeks, I suppose, as, as the managing director of a company, we have, or I have tried to ensure that my suppliers, tenants, and everybody associated with the group have been shown empathy uh, that we are looking after them from the perspective of that uh, we can get through this together. However, when I went to my landlords and say, for example, banks and stuff like that, I, I was shocked at their response. And I suppose it led me to ask the question of myself, am I really too empathetic as a leader to survive going forward? Thank you. 
Well, James, that's a, that's a real tough question, a question and an ethical one, and back to Socrates and ethos, but also back to a kind of shrewdness, etc. I mean, if the environment we live in um, is win-win and it's based on contracts and obligations, and that's the game we're in, then we have to play it. But what I would say quickly on top of that is, um, you know, in the early days when, you know, I was around and haven't gone to, you know, worked in some kind of tough businesses, including that bike shop where we had to, you know, sell each 50 bikes in a day and, and you know, get them out the door, you know, assemble them and all the rest of it, etc. And it was very much win-lose kind of thing. But as the world has progressed, it seems to be more win-win. Uh, so, um, you know, a person might get caught short now by banks and all the rest of it. Um, in, in the short term, but in the long term, it looks like you will be a winner. And if you look at uh, Trump, etc., who will be a win-lose kind of guy, in fact, he's a, an out-and-out -out narcissist, etc., you can see how society at a certain point in time turns. So the banks are notorious to deal with. I mean, people know that, maybe not at the retail end, but businesses <clears throat> know how bad it is to deal with them, etc. But that percolates up even into government policy eventually and uh, will come to, to, to bite them. So I would say, yeah, um, I'd say you're doing the right thing in the fullness of time, the right thing I, I, uh, hopefully will prevail. I don't know if anyone has a, a better or a different answer to that one. Uh, Thank you. Roland, James. Great. Thank you, Dermot, for that. Um, and Carl Daly has a question for you. There's a lot of talk about the compassionate leader versus the dictator. Is this a new phenomenon where compassion is to the fore or has it always been there? Um, compassion has always been to the fore, but a, a useful thing, and uh, you know, there's a there's a short slide set, sort of more or less ten references that that can be sent to participants if they want. But one would be a recently well-known thing uh, by Goldman, and this is connected with the emotional intelligence movement, and then of course the multiple intelligent movement. But what he says is there's six different styles. One would be the affiliative style, which is close to what Anne is actually talking about there. One would be democratic. One would be pace setting. One would be coaching, and one would be commanding and in the days where you could command people to better physical effort the commanding one actually worked and um, but uh, people who've read Dan Pink's book will know that sometimes the extra pressure doesn't actually work so he did an experiment in the states and then did the same experiment in, in India you know so reward in the states of a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars is quite something but when you go to India it's it's magnified and he found the pressure actually you know, um, you know, didn't result, it had a negative kind of effect. So with work that we do today, which is social and interactive and based on humor, and certainly based on intellect, etc., it's a bit like somebody standing over you as you type, you know, it doesn't seem to work anymore. And that's what I'm saying, that it is a new digital age. And I think the affiliative empathetic style uh, does work. I mean, there's still a little bit, like I said before, you know, you don't, can't persist with this forever. You're basically trying to set a challenge to people, say, look, we have to be world-class. It's not actually an option. Uh, anyone who wants to be in the boat and pull on an oar, we, we have have room for that but really you have to succeed you must succeed we'll help you succeed and if, if if together we don't actually make it well you know you have to leave the boat so it's that yin and yang again it's it's a combination of um, vision ambition empathy but also the, the rigor to actually um, to actually move people on ultimately if 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 you can't actually compete in the market I mean you haven't got a competitive advantage you shouldn't compete you're going to lose so I uh, hope I'm not being too hard on people there. So the basis, yes, is empathy and coaching, but it has to be with the goal of actually uh, getting somewhere. It's a global global world now. And that, that may come from, from different parts of the organization. Michael, Michael Burke here has a question about the sales career and uh, whether you, you might agree, is it, a, is it a good foundation, great foundation in learning and understanding your own leadership abilities? And uh, yes. uh, is it undervalued in Ireland? as a profession in the UK? Oh, uh, hugely undervalued in Ireland and, and even more undervalued in uh, in the UK where it's seen as grimy commercialism and, you know, Del Boy kind of stuff, etc. But uh, I'm also involved in an Enterprise Ireland programme. It's called Spotlight on Skills. And one of the big things that's, uh, that's um, looked for there is people who can actually do uh, sales, um, probably better known as business development because sales is seen as a transactional thing. And actually in a transactional thing, and um, people who are a little bit more like Donald Trump, you know, a little bit on the psychopathic side, actually, where they understand people but don't actually care, they do 
quite well. But that kind of sale is actually being automated out of existence. So the business development one, we understand the technicalities, understand the customer's environment, that takes the exact kind of skills that you will find in leadership. So they're prized and they're rewarded. I mean, you know, big time rewarded, etc. So I would say, yeah, continue the path, get into it and um, stay flexible. And I think that'll work out beautifully. Very good. Very good. Well, Anne, Anne Morgan just came back on, on your response just to give that feedback. She's very happy with what you said. And she shared her own thoughts, which was to do the unpleasant things which have to be done and then plan for the medium and longer term improvements for the business and communicate those upsides to the uh, to staff, which is, uh, is, is great. Good, uh, good response. Thanks for that, Anne. Uh, and then finally, uh, I know we're coming close to, to the end. So I know Sean, your good friend, Sean Brady has, uh, has a question for you as well. So if we can make Sean live. Good I afternoon, Sean. You. Hello, hello, Dermot and Ronan. First of all, congratulations to Ronan and all the, all the Timony team and the great gems of wisdom you have been given us since the lockdown. My question for Professor Duff is, what can we learn from brilliant sports coaches like Brian Cody, Alec Ferguson, and Bina Dobba? He'd probably include Jim Gavin in that list. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Sean. We, we shared the same sporting interest and not long to go now. Let's go for the six in a row. Let's get into the top six. Yeah, we, we, we love that kind of stuff. Now, 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 now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I suppose if you look at all these guys like Jim Gavin, an ultimate, in, an ultimate introvert, etc., and you look at Klopp, not an introvert by any manner of means, etc., so they all come in, in different shapes and forms. Um, but what they have, you know, and Alex Ferguson would have been good in the, in the days when you could throw a shoe across the dressing room, but those, those days are actually gone, so the more empathetic style seems to work. Followed by, I suppose, a supreme coaching style, as you'd find uh, in some of the other managers, like that guy who manages Manchester City. And I suppose the kind of Barcelona techniques, I talked about, you know, leadership is a process. Well, you know, teaching good football skills and tactics is also a process. So th there's method there that doesn't just rely on, on one kind of genius. So um, I suppose that'd be my, my short answer, Sean, but would you care to come back in and give your own view? Because we know it's always interesting. Oh, I'd say, Sean, I'll leave the last word to you. <laughs> well, look, uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Dermot. I think that was the most interesting uh, uh, session with you. And uh, thank you for sharing those, those insights and ideas um, with us. Next week, we'll be, we'll be back again, uh, this time with Professor Vincent Ogutu, who is the Vice Chancellor of Strathmore University in Kenya and Strathmore Business School, which is one of the, the 15 associate associated business schools that Timony is part of internationally. And I'll be taking the opportunity to talk with um, Professor Vincent on the timely topic of the future of work, building on some of the points that, that Dermot has, uh, has raised here with us uh, this afternoon, and exploring the changes that are happening that will affect all our organizations over the, uh, the next while in which the pandemic in some way has, uh, has fast-tracked for us. Please do note, though, that the webinar will be on Thursday, uh, the 18th of June, and it will also be at the time of 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And we'll send out details about that early next week. If you've missed any of our earlier webinars, uh, you can find them on our Timony website and also on our Timony YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to it and, uh, and share it with other leaders who you think might, uh, might benefit from it as well. And in the meantime, uh, stay safe and have a great day. And thank you very much again.